that is one of the reasons why in Buddhism the teacher is regard, regarded to be, in India in general and particularly in Buddhism, why teacher is regarded to be the most kind of important task in, you know, in, the, in the society. Buddha himself is a teacher, right? And, uh, and how the teaching should be transmitted is not that easy. The teacher has to be very skillful. I'm not going to narrate uh, the, all the qualities that are, you know, as per the classical kind of classic text and traditionally required for a teacher. To some of the things, the teacher required to be compassionate, having very serious concern about uh, the student, and who can disseminate and who can transfer and transmit the wisdom and the knowledge to the extent that the student can become an accomplished person, holistically developed person, right? This is how the teacher should have in mind uh, to have one's own stu student to be, you know, accomplished uh, uh, in terms of development of, you know, uh, the knowledge, the information, and the subject knowledge, at the same time development of a personality. And this is uh, something that uh, we must, uh, you know, uh, pay attention and uh, make attempt to become our teachers, uh, to be qualified in that sense, right? So I hope that uh, the coming uh, two weeks uh, workshop would be very beneficial. When I learned that, I did not know earlier that uh, Mrs. Sophie uh, was uh, teaching in uh, in Ladakh and in in in, uh, in Canada in Montreal. Uh, but later, I came to know that uh, she was giving a course and training in in a school in Ladakh. And prior to that, uh, she already uh, has been teaching in Montreal in schools. And also, you were awarded by. Uh, Canada government, isn't it? Oh, I'm, I work with the Ministry of Education in Quebec. I see. The, the province of Quebec. I see. Yeah. So, which is, uh, I think, very good, uh, you know, opportunity for all of you. And her husband is uh, a very distinguished scholar and a friend of mine. And uh, and she's very fortunate that she has a very good resource person <laughs> to work with uh, to develop these uh, courses. Uh, uh, so, you're quite, you know, fortunate, uh, and uh, I'm happy that, uh, you know, to have uh, uh, Mrs. Sophie Langri with us, and I hope that we can, you know, certainly you will go back with uh, some very practical, you know, experience, but, uh, and perhaps we might meet at the end, and in between also I will show up uh, during your workshop. And I think you will uh, go back with some experience and some skills and instruments uh, uh, of transformation for yourself and uh, some instruments uh, to transform your, you know, students. Because now, these days, in fact, uh, these kind of trainings are uh, in our tradition. Uh, but. Uh, our own schools in the Tibetan community and the Buddhist community are bereft of this opportunity. So many of these social emotional learnings and emotional regulations, emotion regulation trainings and mindfulness trainings and secular ethics trainings are being introduced in Western schools in the schools in, I think, in Vancouver, many of the schools, uh, oh, more than 2,000. Yeah. Yeah, it's by a law. Yeah, it, it is a law. And now you see, here in India, the law is way back, <laughs> is, you know, um, yet to come, but uh, some kind of initial practices are yet to be introduced, right? It must be introduced. This is, in fact, our tradition which we do not have incorporate, uh, incorporated in our own uh, courses and, uh, you know, uh, syllabus. So we must do this, and once you do this, and then seriously, 
if you feel this because this is a mental exercise not just you know collecting some informations and data and things like that but you have to personally involved to get involved in this feel it then only you can develop and you know uh, uh, cultivate some kind of you know skills right so please uh, be serious on this and then uh, you know also have very um, intensive and open discussions with the, the resource person how if you you know you can also think about you know some problems that you have in your schools in your classrooms certain particular kind of issues you can bring up those issues and uh, and uh, and then discuss about uh, how to solve those problems right so when i was giving a workshop to a group of uh, teachers uh, from um, noida um, and uh, um, uh, delhi and uh, and uh, gurgaon places uh, so there were about uh, 25 teachers from different schools so we were discussing on many of these issues uh, we had uh, four round of uh, workshops and in one of the workshops one lady uh, she actually was not a registered kind of member but in the second uh, uh, workshop she was uh, given the information about the workshop and her friend brought her to the workshop and in the first uh, session when we discussed about the emotions and regulation of emotions and the problems that we have in our society and at, in the individual you know capacity then at the end of the session she raised her hand and uh, i'm going through these kind of emotions very strongly these days and i have lots of problem in my family so how should i you know um, how you can help me in this then we had some discussions and she was ready to you know um, make her case as a case study and then we started working on her how what are the problems that she has who are the you know people who are in that you know the whole you know the scenario of the problem and then she brought every element of the problem clearly on the table and then we started working on it most importantly we asked her how she used to you know react on each of those problems who are who according to her are the sources because of which she had these problems and then we started doing some case studies and then at the end of second day then she said that now i got some clues about you know really some practical clues how to handle this earlier when she was uh, about to come to the workshop then her mm, the uh, the the uh, uh, in love in laws told her that uh, why you are wasting your time in going attending some workshops like that these are all just uh, bogus and uh, nonsense and uh, it doesn't make any difference to your life and uh, so better to avoid this and then after she went back when she when we had the third workshop uh, um, about a month later then she came up with a smiling face and it was uh, she who raised her hand and then uh, said that i have the report now i ha i need to give the report first let me give the report and she said that it changed my life <coughs> and my in-laws have st you know started saying that don't miss this workshop this has changed your life and this has changed the life of our family so don't miss that just to keep asking your friend when this next workshop is going to take place so then she said that uh, her husband her you know in-law fa father-in-law and mother-in-law and sister-in-law everybody started changing their whole kind of you know attitude because she changed she was a very efficient teacher very with a very good earning and she was she was quite arrogant we learned from our case study we learned that she was very arrogant and never you know was not ready to listen to her you know in-laws and the husband and uh, you know people in the fam family and once she realized that it was from her point 
uh, that she has to bring some change, then everything changed in the family. So this is how, you know, our relations can change, our behaviors can change based on our own mental attitude. For that, we have to work on our mind. So I think for your individual case, for your individual life, if there is anything that uh, you that makes you unhappy, then you have to work on that. You know, work on it and uh, understand the reality. For any kind of uh, emotions regulation and training, one very important, most important thing is to know about the reality. Reality of the situation, reality of the you know circumstance, reality of the mentality of other person, reality of the you know social system. If you understand the reality of the situation, then everything is based on that, and because of that, you know through that process you can bring changes, right? So in Buddhism we say that marigba, not knowing the reality, is the very source of your afflictive mind. And once you have afflictive mind, that you know um, brings up uh, afflictive you know uh, action, and then the afflictive emo uh, afflictive uh, kind of negative uh, karma or action brings you know ends up with the suffering. So this is the whole vicious kind of circle that we uh, have uh, in our life, and also this is very very elaborately, distinctly and the sophisticatedly, you know, uh, demonstrated uh, in our classical texts, and it is practiced, and we have a very strong and lively, you know, tradition of practice. So this is what uh, the, which is brought up as a social emotional learning is a very, uh, you know, part of that, through which you can, if you want to move further, then you can move further through more serious practices, mm -hmm. right? So I hope that you will, uh, you know, learn a lot and get lots of experience, which will certainly be very beneficial. And uh, I hope that it's a life-changing, really. So we thought that uh, we must share this with some other institution schools. So we have uh, invited uh, uh, teachers from three schools, right? Initially, we uh, proposed uh, uh, five teachers from each school, but uh, uh, because of their schedules, they are not uh, uh, able to se send uh, uh, five teachers, but um, there are representatives from, uh, from each of the five schools, right? Yeah? School administration, administration or something. Mm -hmm. OK. And then, of course, our teachers of the teacher department, uh, uh, teaching department, and the students. Uh, you are lucky that. Uh, you're not in the fourth you know, year, otherwise you would be in training. Uh, and, then, um, <coughs> and then, so at the end, I hope uh, that you will uh, uh, get a wonderful experience. Thank you very much, and thank you, for Sophie, for coming, please. Hello. <coughs> and you can communicate her in Tibetan also, please. She knows Tibetan very well. Huh? Yeah. So just so I get a, a visual on this, uh, in-service teachers, can you raise your hand? I think you're, okay, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, okay. Uh, first year student, no, uh, yes, uh, second year, no, third year, okay, there's quite a bit of you, okay. And we have two counselors, right? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so um, just so I, I tell you a little bit more maybe about myself. Uh, so I've, I've been doing this for 10 years now, and uh, it's, it's a strange thing because I'm not a teacher. Well, actually, I do have teaching experience, but I used to teach skiing. <laughs> so I used to teach skiing, and I used to coach uh, skiers for racing. So it's a very different kind of teaching. But one thing was for sure is that my, I had to keep my students safe. And although we think our schools are safe, but sometimes emotionally speaking, our students are not that safe. So I learned that. And I also learned something very quick, 
that there are no bad students, but just bad teachers. So <laughs> when I was trying to have my students parallel ski, and one, one year I had a class, it was so difficult. They were like six years old and they were always doing snowplow. You know, it's when you go down with your skis like this and I want them to ski like this and it's not working. So I got a little bit upset and I said, okay, this is not working. So here you, show us how to do it. So the little girl that I've been trying to teach for like weeks, steps in front of the class and says to the class, okay, everybody, put your skis together and let's go down like this. And I swear they all skied parallel. <laughs> and I thought, okay, the problem was me. It's not the children. They, they knew how to do this. Somehow I didn't do a good job. So the, t the children taught me this. And I think that's the greatest lesson I've ever heard. I mean, not heard, learned. So now in Montreal, I teach twice uh, a week. I do two days in a private, well, a small private primary school. Uh, I teach K-6. Um, I teach social emotional learning. That means that I do have lessons. This is our program. This is what we've developed. So there's 20 lessons here, but we've developed way more lessons than that as the years went on. So we go through a whole process of emotional literacy. We teach conflict resolution and we teach collaborative learning also, how to collaborate together. And, you know, while we're doing all of this, well, of course, we end up with children having uh, problems with their friends, children who are fighting, children who need to see counselors. So we deal with a lot of things. And what's wonderful about social emotional learning is that very quickly you can make sense of any situation that you face. And you can know what's going on. You, you will not fix things, but you will understand. And you will know where to get help or how maybe to go get help and find someone to help these children, ask a colleague for help. So social emotional learning gives you a very quick understanding of what's happening. The other thing is I've been working with the Ministry of Education in Quebec for, for three, uh, almost four years. So Tara and I are consultants, Tara that you will meet next week. Uh, we're consultant on social emotional learning. So they hired us to develop a presentation that we brought across the whole of Quebec to, I don't know, a couple of thousands of schools. Uh, I didn't go in person, <laughs> but we just, we, we, we gather a lot of schools in one go in each area we have 17 and then we present what social emotional learning is. And we're not training people, we're just giving the information. This week, we, we're going to have enough time to go deeper. Normally, in, in Canada, we're given one hour. People say, can you come and train my teachers for one hour? And I'm like, I'm sorry, that's going to be just an information session. We need more time for this because you will see, you, you become the model. And Gishela talked about relationships. Social emotional learning is about relationship. This is the heart of it. And what we're trying to achieve is healthy relationships. So this is the most important thing. I'm going to start now with my presentation. Um, it's, it looks a lot like what we present to, to all the schools when we go across Quebec. So we're going to just see the background of social emotional learning, uh, the principles, and uh, then after that, a period of questions, break, and then after that, we're going to do something silly because I like to do something silly. I like to do, I, I wouldn't call them games, no. We're gonna practice, uh, I'm gonna make you practice what we do with the classes. And I want you to keep in mind that every time we do an exercise, an icebreaker, we call them, or a silly thing, it's always based on social emotional learning. So it's not just out of the blue for, for just for fun. There's always a reason for it. And I can go all the way back to the science behind it. <laughs> if you're not sure, come and see me and I'll explain it to you. Okay? And you can always ask questions as we go. Oh, uh, just before we start, who's not really fluent in English? A little bit, right? So you have to help each other. And if you don't understand, raise your hand, we we'll slow down. Okay? So. Oh, one thing I forgot to tell you, um, I'm hearing impaired, so I have hearing aids. And I'm always mm -hmm. like, what, what, what? So, sorry, <laughs> it's not you, it's me. So, 
I'm, I'm asking you to be patient. And if you're asking me something and I say something really crazy that doesn't make sense, just say, Sophie, that's not what I said. <laughs> okay, so again, that's because I misunderstood something. So don't be, don't be shy, and I'm, I'm not going to be shy, if, and I'm going to say, hey, look, I can't hear, okay? Working? So, while, while this is warming up, also maybe I can tell you a little bit about my, my friend Tara, who's coming next week. Uh, she's a school psychologist. So with her, what we're going to do is we're going to look more into uh, learning issues, how the brain learns, and also for the counselors, that might be interesting to, to have some uh, discussions with her, talk about real cases. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also very good with conflict resolution, but Tara, for the, from the psychological angle, is uh, uh, really got the knowledge. And this week, we're going to really do a lot of emotional literacy. So, teacher and student well-being. So it's, it's important that you keep well-being in mind. Uh, this is a new thing now in <laughs> North America. The new word in education is teacher well-being. That's the new thing. Everybody's looking into how we can help teacher uh, become more resilient. And the latest studies that are coming out are quite fascinating about uh, mindfulness. So there was a study done by... Um, uh, a lady called Tish Jennings. She's in Education Department, Virginia University. She's going to be in Dharamsala uh, in two weeks at the Mind and Life Conference. So she trained teachers in mindfulness. They wanted to see how it was helping the teachers. And meanwhile, they were checking also what was happening to the students of these teachers. But the students were not given any kind of intervention. And turns out that the teachers did better, and so did the students. So the grades improved. Happiness, well-being, everything improved. So uh, I'm the co-founder with Tara of this Institute of Social and Emotional Education. You can find us on this website. It's still very basic. Um, we're cr we've created the CS3 curriculum, which means core skills in three domains. And this is what you're going to learn today. And I have two daughters who are now... 19 and 21. So, by the time we're, we're done, um, I would really like you to have a good understanding of what social-emotional learning is, um, how it helps students, and also how it impacts you in your teaching and in your well-being. Um, how to look for opportunities and where can we teach cell? Where does it happen also in the school? and how you can incorporate it everywhere, school, class, and even personal life. I've, by the way, I'm, I'm so jet lag, I'm <laughs> going back and forth, but uh, this is something I also teach in the workplace. So it's not just for children, it's really for everybody. Uh, social emotional learning, so how to educate the heart and mind. Now, I want you to think about your favorite teacher. Think about your favorite teacher when you were a student and find out one word. Give me one word that could describe that teacher. Think about it. So did you find a word that describes that teacher? Give me a word. So in my case, it was my grade... Um, grade five teacher, and the word to describe him was compassionate. Hmm? Understanding. Kind. What else? Yes. Hmm? Security, safety, that's a good one. Understanding. Hmm? Speak loud. Motivated, yes. Resourceful, super. What else? Any any other words? Hmm? Oh, friendly. Oh, it's gonna be hard for me this week. <laughs> okay, so friend, um, so friendship actually. Okay, anything else? 
Efficient. Well wisher. Oh. Well wisher. Well wisher. Oh, that's a that I never heard this one. Well wisher. <laughs> no, no, I'm just trying you, you see why I'm thinking because you're gonna learn tomorrow about needs. And I'm trying to figure out, oh, what need does that meet? Well wishing. Uh, joy? Happiness? Uh, caring. caring, yes. Oh wonderful. Okay. So all these words you've just given me are not about cognitive skills. They're, what we, they're, they're about social emotional learning. These words you just said represent the type of relationship you had with that teacher or that teacher had with you. And this is what is left at the end. And we know as human beings, when we have a positive and healthy relationship, we always keep this feeling inside. So social emotional learning is really about this. So what, what is social emotional learning? It's the process of developing the skills and competencies related to recognizing and managing your emotions, developing care and concern for others, establishing positive relationships, making responsible decisions, setting and achieving positive goals, and handling challenging situations in a constructive way. Uh, so this is a, at the bottom, if you're interested, this is a big study that was done. It's a meta-analysis. Uh, it's the study that was done after many years of studying children and students who've gone through social emotional learning programs. And what they discovered is that this really helped improve um, the academics. Oh, oh sorry, I'm one at a time. Where did, what, where did it come from, social emotional learning? If, are you familiar with Daniel Goleman? Okay, so Dan Goleman in the 90s started talking about the fact that emotional intelligence is as important, if not more, than IQ. And so people started wondering, oh, well, if it's that important and if it's so useful in our lives, probably we should teach it. And how do we do this? And how do we bring it to schools? So. Dan Goldman made the point, and <laughs> sure enough, the research showed us that EQ, what they call an emotional quotient, is more important than IQ in terms of our well-being. Research tells us that better indicator of success and well-being is the emotional intelligence. And wait, before I show you this, it was another fun study that said. Um, what is the best predictor of academic success in high school two, which would be grade seven, uh, eight for you? You count the grades like this, right? From K to 12? Okay, so what's the best predictor of academic success for students in, high, in grade eight? So the best indicator was their social skills when they were in grade three as small kids. So children with good social skills in grade three do better at high school, no matter the academics. So it's very important. And what happens when we have a good social emotional program, the impacts are, are amazing. We, we see for the student gains, social and emotional skills improved. Uh, the attitude about self, others, and schools. Uh, we see more positive behavior. 11% uh, gain in academic achievement, which is huge. And on the other side, we reduced a lot of risk, such as you know behavior pro problem, uh, violence, emotional distress, and it's not written there, but also school dropout. So the dropping out rates, it really helps uh, to prevent. So social emotional learning really acts as a, it prevents so many things. It has many, many fields of impact. So improves academics, improves emotional well-being, improves relationships. Uh, what else? I forget. Helps with conflict. Uh, in Quebec, where I was working, <laughs> there's um, uh, an organization that, monitors violence in school, in all the schools, 
And one day they came to our office and they have this huge book and it's about this thick and it's got 6,000 pages and they, boom, you know, they put this on our desk and they go, okay, we've studied everything. We've studied all the programs. We've studied everything and we found the one thing that works for everything. And Tara and I are, are like, oh, social emotional learning, how do you know that? So <laughs> they finally got to the realization that with Cell, you have so much impact that whatever, you know, in our school right now, there's so many programs. Why, you know, gets, and it's tiring. You, you know, teachers, you're busy. You don't have much time and you don't want to have another program on top of what you have to do. So why don't we just do this? We prevent by having strong social emotional program or I would rather say skills of the teachers and then you can add whatever you want after. But we need to start from there. So cell actually comes below, if, you, if we have a pyramid in our schools, it comes below academics and all the other pro programs. This is your basis, this is your foundation. Cell will support everything else after. Um, this is from Cassell. So Cassell is, it means, oh, I always have a problem with this one, it's too long. Co collaborative for academic, social and emotional learning. Okay, I got it right. So Cassell names five key components. Now these five components, they represent social emotional learning. And they are self-awareness and self-management, responsible, uh, no sorry, social awareness and relationship skills, because normally they have numbers. So this is cell one, two, cell three, social awareness, relationship skills, and five, responsible decision making. And the zone of impact, so are also quite vast, there's the classroom. So if you have a good uh, social emotional learning in your class, it will have an impact on your class. If your school, aligns with social emotional learning, it will have an impact on your school. Uh, we talk about school climate, positive school climate. Um, you must have incidents of bullying in your school. So, yeah. so in Quebec, people, all the schools, the teachers, they got fed up at one point about being told that bullying had to stop. They're like, we can't take it anymore, we know, but... So we changed the language. What we're talking about now is not um, anti-bullying campaigns and things. We're talking about let's develop a positive school climate. Let's develop a compassionate school climate. And that's much better now because now people want to get involved in this. So cell will impact the class, your school, and then the community at large. But cell, the, the skills have to be taught every year. So it's not as if I do one workshop and then I'm done and let's move on. This is something that has to be cultivated and just as you teach reading, imagine if you taught reading for the first week in September in grade one and you stop there. So same with social emotional skills. You need to think, okay, this is something we teach throughout the year all the time, and all the way up I would argue now looking at my kids who are going to university in Canada uh, to the first year of university. Social skills of the students at university that I see now are quite poor, actually alarmingly poor. And I was shocked to learn this year that the Canadian university's budget for mental health has gone up 300% in the last 10 years. That's, that's really like scary. So the youngsters, the young adults who go to university right now in Canada are not really young adults. They're more like late teenagers and they're struggling. Um, my, f my daughter has a friend who's 19, second year university, and she's been bullied this year. I just couldn't believe it. Normally, you know, it's finished by then and we think, oh, they're over this. But no, she, she has been bullied and it was terribly hard on her. So we're going to need this all the way up to university. Um, as teachers, we always say yes, but we don't have time. So I, I know what you mean. Uh, but again, if we don't teach it, it's more costly. Uh, when I first started the program at, at the school where I work, 
The teachers had no idea what was going on. They thought what I was doing was very strange. They were a bit impatient with me. Uh, they thought things were going terribly slow, and I was like, just wait, just wait. And it took a few months, and after Christmas break, we come back in January, and then boom. Then the teacher's like, oh, okay, now I get it, wow. Oh my goodness, I'm saving so much time, I don't have to talk you know, for so long. Every time there's an incident, they understand what we're talking about. So it takes time, but you buy time in the end. And when we talk about prevention, that's what it is. Prevention takes time. It's, it's constantly working every day on skills and things. And then when difficult things happen, we're ready. But if we don't prevent and if we don't work every day, when difficult things happen, then we're reacting and we're reacting and we're not efficient. And now we get more tired and then there's dangers also of burning out. So this is something that we have to do slowly every day a little bit of the time. Um, for teaching social emotional learning, there are three keys. So the first one is the explicit lesson. So I don't know here uh, in India what you called explicit teaching, but for the purpose of this exercise, I'll make it very simple. So an explicit lesson is really when I explain a concept I have a pedagogical objective. I'm going to explain the concept. Uh, for example, if I take feelings, today we're going to talk about feelings. I explain the science behind feelings. Uh, we talk about feelings with the kids. We have a little activity, and this is my explicit lesson. So it's quite simple. Then the integrated teaching is what I do after this lesson. The next day I'm reading a book, and there are two characters that are, say, having a hard time. So then I asked the kids, oh, how are the characters feeling in this book? What's going on? So for older children in high school, uh, sorry, I'm going to keep saying high school. That means grade 7 to 12 for you. So, so for older children, uh, you're reading a book. So you can ask them to work on the character's emotions and, and explain or write about it. So you're reintegrating this as you go in your curriculum. Are there some physical uh, education teachers here? No, okay. But say you're teaching that, you're playing a game, a kid loses and they start getting upset. You're going to reinvest your feelings. Oh, how are you feeling right now? It looks like it's difficult for you. Uh, and science, same thing. I know that this is more difficult because like, well, I'm teaching science. How can I bring this into science? Um, your students are working in group. They're doing collaborative work. Someone's participating, someone isn't. So how are you going to talk about uh, everybody's emotions are, how can we participate better? So this is how you reinvest in your curriculum. And then again, which is a little bit similar, but daily practice. Two students come from recess crying. Okay, so looks like there was a problem. So everybody, let's talk about our feelings and needs. This is, the needs are, is coming. We're going to talk about that. So explicit, integrated in your lessons. And actually integrated is not like I'm going crazy to, to do this. I'm like, I'm finding opportunities to teach this. So when I see them, well, I just jump on the opportunity and there you go. So this is done. And then the daily practice, real life situation, something that happens in the school and we reinvest over there. Ah, now the good news. So we are the model. So as much as I teach all these skills to students, I'm the model of these skills. As an adult, I am the model. So if I want the children to respect me and I start screaming, well, I'm a very poor model of respect. And if I'm constantly dysregulated, if I shout at my class, if I'm angry, if I'm upset, if I bring this kind of energy to the class, I'm a very poor model of being calm, respectful. And on top of that, I contaminate everything, everybody in the class. Because brains, human brains are very sensitive, and especially the ones of children. So my emotions affect others, even if they, if they don't look like they're affected. And how many times do I hear parents say, oh, my daughter had a bad day. She says the teacher screams all the time. And <laughs> even if it's not at her, she's scared. So what's happening, and you know, 
do you know the story of the portable brain? So take your hand like this. So let's pretend that this is your brain. You have just put it up and put your thumb in the middle and close your fingers. So this is the frontal cortex, actually part over here, which is the one we need for thinking and learning, memori memorizing. And in the middle, this is the limbic system. So when we go through strong emotion, what happens is it call, it's called flipping your lid. This is a neuroscientist that coined that, like, ah! You know, so oh, there goes, the, most of my blood goes to the middle, to the center of emotions. And now am I thinking straight? Not really. <laughs> so even you, when you do some intervention with children and the children are crying or screaming or having a tantrum, their brain's like this. Whatever you say to them is not going to go in. It's not the right time to talk. It's the time to help them do this. And what's the best way to help a small child or a teenager do that? Do you have any idea? By yourself being calm and regulated, you're going to help their brains regulate right there. And then they can take over and start doing it themselves. But the human brain is very sensitive and, and clever. If I'm regulated, everybody gets regulated. And if I'm dysregulated, I can dysregulate people. And we think we're very smart as adults, but <laughs> sometimes small children dysregulate us. So we need to be smart about this. And when we see small children having a tantrum, I have to put a, I call it the bubble, and come cool as a cucumber. And this is the most helpful thing. And then we can do the intervention after, but not right there, because the brain's like this. So I am the model. That means I have to have this awareness of what's going on inside of me while I'm paying attention to what's going on outside of me. And teachers have the most difficult jobs because you have to be aware of how many kids do you have per class? The TCV right now, how many children per class? 27? Okay, Twen so just around 30 say. Okay, so imagine you're taking care of 30 little brains that go through all kinds of emotion while you're going through all kinds of emotion and you need to manage all of this and transmit some information and, and you want people to learn. That, that's crazy. No, it's wonderful at the same time. I keep telling the teachers, you're like, you have the most difficult job. Doctors deal with one patient at a time. And as teachers, we have to deal with a whole class at a time, all day, all week. So we're like black belt. <laughs> of emotions and and that's why we our model has to also be at that level you know being aware that it's complex you're doing something difficult and you're above average in terms of managing your emotions and handling those of the students around you so this is for North America so I'd be curious here I think it's probably the same thing we, there are not many institutions that talk about social-emotional learning. I bet it's the same here. In Canada, it's almost non-existent. Um, teachers don't take the time to think about their own skills. This is new for us, to think about, wow, okay, where am I on my skills or what's going on inside of me? And very few teachers uh, know about self-care, how to take care of ourselves when you know, we've, we've just had a rough week or things have been difficult. Uh, you know, you may have some different, difficult classes. Some years are difficult. We, I know I have some, <laughs> we have at my school, we had the most difficult, uh, we call them co cohort in French. I don't know what the, the English word is, but one, there was one class when they came into kindergarten. It was so difficult. We had 50 children out of which 25 heavy cases behavior cases, uh, it was all kinds of things. It was so difficult. And we, we just decided as a school co that we're gonna put everything and focus on this gang because they need so much help. They're now in grade six. <laughs> uh, they're doing really well, but it's still not over. We, we work so hard with them. So when you work with a group like that, you really need to take care of yourself all the time because it's gonna wear you down. Um, when there's too much stress for teachers, what happens is, of course, there's a high turnover rate. Um, teachers miss a lot of time. 
uh, sick leave, the performance goes down. And also, whatever happens to you impacts your class. So if, if you're not doing well, well, your class is not going to do that well. If you're doing great, your class goes with you. So you really are a model. And there is a lot of stress contagion happening. Contagion happening. And this is, oh no, that's not the study I was mentioning before. But this is another study that's very interesting about how our stress affects our students. So, yeah. Oh, I thought it was a question outside. Okay, so forget all that I said up till now. And what I want you to remember is this. And I'm sorry, it's very small. I had photocopied that I brought from Canada and I forgot them when I left. Um, I have a photo, a photocopy of this, so you'll get it tomorrow. But this is what Tara and I came up with after 10 years of work. And this is called the CS3 Practical Framework. So what we did is the beautiful five cell component that is very hard to remember and it's full of information that doesn't make much sense to me. We reorganized it in three domains. So the first domain is called the me domain. It's about what's happening inside myself. So it's cell one and two, self-awareness, self-management okay actually you can draw it yeah that would be good so the me domain is about what's going on inside of myself how i can learn and manage my uh, learn about yeah okay Th there it is so name our feelings and needs demonstrate empathy for oneself no i'm not with the others yet it's just about me um, identify my strengths and challenges and have an optimistic outlook. So self-empathy here, we, we use empathy when we talk to teachers in North America. Uh, you can call it also self-compassion. So the idea is being kind to oneself. Uh, I don't know about what you're seeing in the schools. I'm, I'm happy we have in-service teachers. What about anxiety in children? You seeing any of a lot of anxiety or no? Yeah. So anxious? No. Yes. In in Canada, it's skyrocketing. I have children in kindergarten who have panic attacks now and don't want to show their drawings to other people because they're scared of being judged. So anxiety is is, in my opinion, going to get worse and worse. Children with high anxiety are very quick to undermine themselves. Nah, I'm not good, I'm, I can't do this, I'm not able to do that. And they don't have an optimistic outlook. It's not gonna work. I mean, have you ever seen a five-year-old go, oh, I don't wanna draw today. Come on, five, come on, I, they're crayon. <laughs> this is not, it's not good. Uh, these children have low self-esteem and they're pretty much grumpy all the time. It's very sad. So. This is, you know when you see a child like this, that we're going to have to work on these skills. Cell two is self-management. So it's to name and regulate our emotions. So just, it's not, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm not fine. I bet you it's the same in Tibetan. And it's like, there are more words than that, right? So we use two or three or four, and we think we're emotionally literate. We're not. So we need to develop a vocabulary to name properly. Are you angry or frustrated? It's not the same. Same family, but not the same. Um, how do I regulate? How do I control this after? OK, I've named it. Yes, I'm angry. What do I do with that? <laughs> I can't just stay angry all the time. Uh, how do I manage stress, impulsivity, anger, disappointment? That's a lot for small children in kindergarten again. You know, disappointment comes fast, and you can see some kids handle it with, you know, without any problems, and some linger on it. And these children that I see in kindergarten in grade six, you know, if we haven't worked on this, if the teachers don't pinpoint, oh, wow, okay, I'm, I'm going to help that kid overcome this, well, that stays. Um, being able to wait. Okay, this one is fun. 
Um, there's a famous experiment called the marshmallow experiment. You know marshmallows? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's a, a psychologist that has a child sitting down and says, okay, here's one marshmallow, you wait, and if you can wait, I'll give you two, but don't eat it. But if you want to eat it, okay, go ahead. And then the scientist goes out, <laughs> this terrible experiment. And, and it goes out for like four minutes, and this is a five-year-old kid. So they film, of course, and then you see some children look at the marshmallow and they start singing, trying to think about something else because they know they're going to get two. And then they get two, and then some kids can't wait, and they just take a bite, and, and then some eat the whole thing. And what they found out is that the children who were able to wait, like it's called also delaying gratification, did much better later on in their lives and um, they, they also achieved, that. I, I'm, I don't have the study clearly in my mind, but I think also it impacted their academics. So when you see children who are very quick, they can't tolerate delays, whether it's like, I want this, <laughs> or you know, just simple things like this, these are things we need to work with and help them overcome that. So very important. And now the last line is the most important. Self-regulation is the process that allows us to be motivated, focus, set goals, and reach them. So actually, cell one and two, self-awareness and self-management uh, self is at the heart of academic success. It took me a long time to understand that. I'm like, how can naming emotions and managing them really help the academics? It's really about, it's the whole process of achieving motivation, setting my goals, being able to wait while I'm working for it, and getting there and feeling happy and proud. And even if I fail, you know, going, oh, I can do it again. So it's fundamental for our children. So it's not just about naming your emotions. So we're nice and we don't fight. It's much more than that. It's very important. It really supports academic learning and achievement. And I'm not saying that because I want kids to have good grades. I had terrible grades at school. I was horrible. <laughs> so it took me a while. I, I started achieving better results at university, which pretty much probably led me to do what I'm doing now because I was told as a child that I was a terrible student all my life. And that got me very angry. <laughs> so, uh, but so if you understand that this process, emotional literacy, management, really goes deeper than that, it's, yes, it will help for conflict management and it will make us uh, more compassionate, empathetic, but it also supports academic and it also trains attention. Any problems with attention in the school? Yes. Okay, so it's same with us. Less and less attention, and I'm not a scientist. I don't know where it comes from. I have a good eye. Well, I, I'm sure that screen time, uh, I don't know here if the children spend as much time on the internet than our kids do. Um, cell phone. So, the, I mean, this is not the only reason. But, you know, the attention is a problem. So it's, this is something that, as schools, we need to think about and train even more. We always took it for granted that the kids came to school, they were pretty, pretty well-behaved, social kids, and they had attention. That's not really the case anymore, anyway, in Canada. We need to pay attention and help train these skills even more. Um, Tara will talk about attention deficit next week. Have you heard of this? So we will talk a bit about learning disabilities and what is a real attention deficit syndrome, what it is exactly. But I can tell you that from what we're seeing in our school, there are the kids who really have a real problem. Attention deficit is a neurological issue. Something is different in your brain. So as much as you're going to tell these kids, do this, do this, do this, their brain is not just doing it the same way yours is. So this is a neurological issue. But we see a lot of children having the same symptoms and they don't have attention deficit. So we also need to help them. And we don't really know where they get it from. Uh, is it, you know, busy family life, always hectic, kids don't sleep anymore. I have small kids that go to bed way too late for their age. Actually, I was shocked in Ladakh. 
kids go to bed so late, I don't know, in the Tibetan community. In Ladakh, kids go to bed at 10, even small ones. They eat supper at 9, go to bed at 10, and then they have to start their school early the next day. And I'm like, wow, how can they do it? So children need a lot more sleep than that. So anyway, there are many reasons. I don't know all the causes, but you will have to pay attention to this attention dimension. And know that by developing emotional literacy, you're also supporting uh, you know, a healthier attention. Okay. So in the me domain, what we use uh, to develop self-awareness um, and regulation is uh, what we call the emotion thermometer. So you have over here, it, it's, these are the same. This one is just images that we found and this is made by a graphic designer. But on this side, you have the iceberg. So the iceberg is obviously a cold place. And these are for strong emotions but more on, it's emotions are like doses of energies, okay? So if I'm really sad, if I'm sick, if I'm depressed, nothing is really moving much inside of me. It's kind of frozen. So this, this image represents that. On the other side, we have the volcano. Now this is a high energy emotion. Anger, excitement, whatever. This is like a volcano about to explode. And in the middle, is the tree with solid roots. So this is calm and alert. This is where I'm balanced and centered. So this is where my brain is like this. Now I'm ready to learn, I'm ready to listen, I can memorize, I can play sports, I can do music, I'm ready. But if, so what do you think? If you're in the volcano, is your brain like this? Okay, if you're in the iceberg, is your brain like this? Same. So different levels of energy, same impact inside the brain. So it is a strong emotion where you're not ready to learn. Kids fighting in a schoolyard, sit in math class like this, not much is gonna happen, okay? So sometimes we're just here. A little bit in the volcano, but I'm still able to listen and learn or I'm a little bit in the ice, uh, volcano or a little bit of the, in the iceberg, but I can still manage to be concentrated. But when I'm in a strong emotion, no way. So how do we do this? How do we get it back there? Because don't forget, most of my blood is here now. I have to bring it back. Any idea how to calm down? Simple things, walking, breathing, Water? Can somebody say water? Yeah, water is really important for the brain. So drinking water, um, somebody's not concentrating in the class, you can say, why don't you go drink water and come back? You know, so then after that, it's better. So there are tons of ways, we're going to talk about them, but there are tons of ways to get back to Calm Alert. But this is very effective. So we start using this at age five, and the kids get it like this. Sometimes I have more time, a harder time explaining this to the adults than the children. It takes a, a little longer. And of course, for the, the literacy part of things, which is the very important one, um, we use a poster with feelings and needs. And for older children, we have cards. So this is, we had designed this for kindergartners. So there's 15 feelings, 15 needs. And honestly, the, the, <laughs> the kids learn it very fast. For older kids, we go up to 20 cards. So that's from grade two to six. And actually starting grade six, we can add another 20 so they can have a pack of 40 cards. I'm gonna talk a little bit about needs here because this is really the heart of what we're using and it's, it comes from nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication was, um, uh, I can't say invented, but was discovered by a psychologist called Marshall Rosenberg. So he's a very famous American psychologist 
And he realized that despite his PhD and all his knowledge, he was not really helping his patient and he was getting frustrated. So he decided to quit his job, he went around the world, tried to look for himself, uh, learned about all the religions, especially Buddhism, came back to the States and then he says, okay, I found something. When you connect, he says, I didn't invent anything, but this is new. When you connect a feeling to a need, something happens. So, you know, if you're saying, oh, I'm so angry, I'm so angry, I'm so angry, oh, I'm angry, I'm angry, and I'm not getting anywhere. I'm so angry because I need respect. My friend took the ball without asking me. Oh, and now I'm regulating myself. So needs act as a very powerful regulator. So when you just have a feeling, it's just there. It's good to name it, but you don't really, you can't say, go away, anger, or as His Holiness says, pray and wish it goes away. But if I connect anger with my, uh, not, a need that is not met, such as respect or friendship or kindness, whew, now I'm regulating something. And the beauty of needs, and this is slightly different than the Buddhist psychology. Can, we can debate about that. So what I'm, the emotional literacy I'm going to show you is slightly different than the Buddhist psychology, but they meet at the end. Maybe not at the beginning, but at the end. The needs are core universal values. So it's not, I need a new ball. If you're not sure we're talking about these needs, ask yourself the question. Do all human beings need an iPad? The answer is no, yeah. Do all human beings need love? Yes, affection, kindness, respect. So these needs are actually core human values. So they're very important. And as you know, I was trained in um, not just conflict resolution, but I'm a mediator. So I help people go through very serious conflict. One thing you learn is that you never achieve conflict resolution at the emotion level. You're angry, she's sad. You know, she's, it's not gonna work. But if you're angry and you need respect, she's sad, she needs friendship, then we go to, oh, okay, respect, friendship. How do we work this out? And there we find a solution because we're on a common ground, human values. But your anger and my sadness, that's not common. This, this is a personal experience. But our needs are common and they're shared. And this is where we will achieve a resolution, conflict resolution. Yes. Oh, it's tea time. Oh, perfect. Thanks for telling me. So we take a break. And I think we had said half an hour, but maybe 15 minutes so I can finish this today. Yeah. Okay, are we ready? So, the me domain, um, again, some, ec uh, some examples of um, how to do self-management. So, just naming your feelings and needs will regulate uh, the person. And then some exercises such as mindfulness. So, mindfulness, meditation. Um, this little kid in kindergarten has a little bean bag on his belly button and we make them breathe. We call them belly, belly buddies. So it's just an exercise to relax. Uh, some other, we call these energy shifting exercise. So this is the idea is to, to bring your, your brain back to this. If I get into a class one day and they're all like this, well, I'm not gonna have them do mindfulness, obviously. I'm gonna have them stand up and stretch, do a bit of yoga next to your desk, do something silly like this. So there's all kinds of exercises we can do. But say if, you, if somebody says, I'm gonna give you a program for your school and it's based on mindfulness, well, now you know that this program is probably focusing on cell one and two, which is very good, but that's what it is. It's focusing on the me domain. Okay, the you domain. So tomorrow, the framework that I showed at the beginning, you're gonna get it tomorrow because you're gonna get um, the intro from the curriculum and it's in there. And this is what I really want you to focus on. This framework is very handy and it's much easier to remember. So the you domain, so let's say now we've worked on my, I've worked on me, on the me domain. I understand my feelings, I can name them. 
I can manage my emotions. I understand the impact of my emotion on myself and my behavior. So now with this knowledge, I can go in the you domain, which is a relationship domain. It's about the other person. And it's uh, social awareness is, so it's being able to demonstrate empathy for others. And that becomes compassion. Understand and accept differences. Um, take, take perspective. Understand that, you know, okay, I may not agree with you, but I understand you have a different opinion. Very hard for small children. And also children on the spectrum, are you familiar with this? Uh, the spectrum children. So this is, a, it's also called autism. So some children, and for them, they really struggle with uh, emotions and social, especially social skills. It's not that they don't have emotion. Often they're portrayed as children without emotion. It's the opposite. They have so much, so many, they don't know how to manage. And they have a very hard time making relationships without connecting with others. So perspective taking for these children is, is very difficult. So if you have a child in your class that always want to do things one way, they're very rigid, they don't want to change, they always want to do it like this, maybe there's something about this. Uh, they might be on the spectrum. Um, understanding social norms, also very important, and know where to find support when needed. Uh, and this is fun because in the Tibetan community, um, there's also, there's, uh, I'm, I'm talking for my experience with my family and my nieces. Often we confuse humility and assertiveness. So being humble is seen as being good. But then when you're in trouble and you need to ask help and you don't, that will give you more trouble. So it's important that you understand that, yes, humility is an important quality. But being assertive in the sense that I want to get help and I know where to get it, is extremely important. And I go all the way down to saying this is also connected to suicide prevention. So as teachers, you're in, you know, you're the first people who could see a child having a hard time asking for help. And it's important that we help them get it and become more assertive, not um, disrespectful. So it's different. Now, the relationship skills. So this is about having positive relationship with adults, peers, and in groups. Now, sometimes kids socialize with one person only. Sometimes they socialize in groups. So you need to be able to, to understand and how does that person function? How does that student function in their relationship? And this is extremely helpful for you because that helps you become good uh, you, you make maps of social dynamics in your groups. You have to be able to read the social dynamics in your group. Who's hanging out with who? Who's doing what? When you're asking kids to do a work, collaborative work, are the best friends always going together? Are some people left out? This is something that you need to track and understand because you, need to, you can have an impact on that. Um, cooperate, teamwork, Managing conflict skillfully, being able to communicate clearly and respectively, uh, respectfully, sorry. Um, listen to the others, not just thinking about myself, being able to also have active listening skills, not just, yeah, yeah, I heard you. Now you do what I want. That's not listening. Like listening is really taking account of what's going on with the other person. And resisting peer pressure, super hard for teenage brains. Teenage brains, uh, I have a friend who teaches at UBC, this is a uh, University of British Columbia. She's a psychologist. She specializes in social emotional learning. She's the one that has the only program, <laughs> master's degree in social emotional learning. And she was explaining to us how the teenage brain gets sucked in by the group, you know? So it's like, <sighs> It wants to belong with their friends, and it's very hard to resist this peer pressure, but if they've got good social-emotional skills, even though they're sucked in by a group, we hope they'll be able to make responsible decisions. And here, it's asked for help. The other one was like, where can I find it? And now I'm going to get it. So one thing that's really fun with the cell skills, the cell components, if you notice, 
Cell one is the awareness, cell two is the action. Cell three is the awareness, cell four is the action. So I'm aware of others, what do I do with that? I'm aware of myself, what do I do with it? One way of teaching this uh, is through conflict resolution. So this is me ages ago, helping kids um, be, by being their mediator. And so here we really have to invest in effective communication. And it comes from, if you remember the graph I showed you at the beginning, in the, in the center there was an orange dot that says feelings and needs. That connects the three domains all the time. In the me domain, you're going to need strong literacy. In the you domain also. So here we're using feelings and needs to sort out conflict. There's no way I can do this with these kids. If they're still dysregulated, angry, and not willing to listen. So first, they've achieved self-awareness and regulation. Now they're ready to go into social awareness and relationship skills. So, Also in the U domain, this is where we do a lot of cooperative learning. And cooperative learning is fantastic. It's, you can do it with a lot of games. But the sad thing is we always think, okay, so they're just games. By putting them together, they play a little bit and they'll learn. They don't learn like that. There's a whole lot of understanding to be done before you engage in collaborative learning. Because when you collaborate also, this is where you're going to need the most or the best communication skills you have because things are going to go wrong. Well, there's some, it's, it's very rare that you work as a group and things go always smoothly. You have to give your opinion. Some people are super shy. Some people just say, no, you do whatever. So in collaborative learning, everybody needs to participate. So we'll also work on that this week. And finally, the us domain, which is the last one, is about the wider community. So we've gone through me, you, and now us. And we've added, Tara and I, we've added, we've added a sixth component called interdependence, interconnectedness. And so it would, the awareness would be this one. Interdependence, which is now what we call cell six, would be understanding systems. Uh, and this is where you also develop more empathy and compassion. You appreciate interconnectedness and interdependence. Uh, we talk about gratitude also. Develop critical thinking and foster a strong, caring environment for all members of the school and the community. This is where we are able to see the community as, as at large. I understand also that I'm part of this and that whatever I choose will have an impact, not just on me, but on others. So, and the responsible decision making is, is about that. So, if I make a decision, is it good for me? Is it beneficial for me? Is it beneficial for others? Uh, if I do this, is it safe for me? Is it safe for others? So the us domain is being in the world, actually. And going into the us domain, where you really have to work with the me and you first. So this is not a linear kind of learning. Like, I'm going to read... You know, I start reading in grade one, and by grade six, I'm over here. This is a spiral kind of learning. So we're always talking about the same skills. You and I are using these skills now. We use it every day. But our experience, our maturity, our brains make our experience richer. So, but the small children have the same kind of skills. And slowly, as they grow up, they're going to develop them more and more according to their experience. And, and what they're learning in life. So it's a spiral learning. I've showed them to you also. I've um, deconstructed them, but they often come all interconnected, very closely knit together. It's very difficult to say, okay, let's just do self-awareness now, or let's just do responsible decision-making. It's a whole lot of, you know, it's all of them together. To get to the us domain, you need very good skills in the me and the you domain first. Um, sadly, in the school, what, what we're seeing in Canada is, especially for like high school, uh, there's a lot of programs going on 
and they focus mostly on the you and the us domain because we think that by then kids are all grown up they should be good they should manage their emotions and now let's be good to the others and let's get invested in the community but you always need to go back to the one and two they're super important so this um, keep that in mind okay and in the us domain what we do at our school is we we really engage the whole community call, uh, in something that we call the kindness week or the compassion week and the children their their activities every day it's quite simple it's not complicated because we don't want to burden the teachers but every time somebody does something kind for you we well, you have to do something kind for someone else and the children are giving a, given a feather they have to write down what they did during the week and at the end of the week we build a big bird or an art art piece so this is one way to to celebrate together and engage the whole community and there's also in the in the united states there's a thing called random acts of kindness have you heard of this they've also developed a whole program if you want to go see online they have i, I haven't read the full program but i think it's quite closely aligned to sell. So this is another idea of how to bring more kindness. And we also do a lot of, um, we develop a lot of critical thinking in the us domain by bringing um, kids and classes to have discussions in large groups. So for example, um, if I take a grade four class, we do a class circle and today we're gonna talk about friendship. And what is friendship? And what is a good friend? What is a bad friend? And then we exchange together and we, and we brainstorm. So you can also go into some more ethical debates. Uh, in Ladakh, we, we, there was a problem with lunch stealing. So we had to have discussion with the children like, <laughs> okay, is this, you know, is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And, and then reflecting on this, like, nah, not really a good idea. So what can we do about this? So we went into like a, a real situation that was more delicate and tried to find solutions together. Yeah. So, so finally, sorry, this is me drawing, trying to draw my spiral. So the cell component uh, cannot be seen as, um, discrete items, although I've shown them to you separately so you understand them well. This is something that comes pretty much in interconnected. Uh, they overlap and build on each other. It's like reading and other topics. Um, it's not a quick and easy process. You need to put effort and time. You need to pay attention. Uh, cell skills need to be addressed every year. So you, you can't just say, I'm gonna do it five minutes and ignore it the rest of the time. This is something Actually, uh, it's, if you think of it as you becoming a model of this, it's not very complicated. It will be a bit of work at the beginning. But when I teach, I'm, I'm kind of embodying this. I don't need to do anything extra. I, yes, I worked hard to build my literacy. It took me three years. Believe it or not, we're very emotionally illiterate. But once I got that going, then it became much easier. And I don't think about it twice. When I'm in a class and when I see an opportunity, it's it's, it's kind of uh, easy and very natural. Um, the tools we've discussed are tools. If, again, if you're not modeling these, they're not much use. And cell needs to be, well, we talked about the three, three keys. And your skills are more important than everything I've shown you now. So before you go out and think about how am I gonna teach this, Think about yourself first. How am I, where are my skills? How can I improve them? And we'll work on that this week. And so think about yourself first, and then we'll think about the students after. Mm, and the last one, research indicates we often focus on the you, well, that's what I've said before. We, we really focus a lot on the you and the us in our schools, but the literacy is critical self-awareness, self-management, have, we have to work on this throughout the school years. So, and adapt it. So this is the beauty of this because I, I'm not teaching 50 different things. We're always teaching these six components. So that's very simple. Now you adapt it to the age of your, of your students. 
I'm not going to do the thing, uh, things the same way with a second grade class and with a 10th grade class. This is different. Although you'd be surprised, I kind of do. <laughs> I kind of do and it, it, it does work. And these are some references if, you, if you're interested in um, going online. So Cassell is, is of course the reference for social emotional learning. Um, Edutopia is wonderful. It's a website with short films so you can get tons of ideas. On, and it's not just about social emotional learning. They have, they have collaborative learning, project-based learning. They have everything there. Um, cellresources.com, this is a Canadian website. Um, cell, which one is this? Oh, this one I've never tried. So cell ECPS. And there's our website, but it's very basic, I'm afraid. We, we haven't really set it up, but it just gives you very basic information. Okay. What time is it? Oh, we're good. So this is, this is it for the presentation. Tomorrow, you're going to get a photocopy where you're going to get the framework, because I really want you to focus more on that. Um, or, um, and before I finish on this uh, presentation, we talked about the three keys for learning, for teaching. But now the other tool I want to talk to you about are the cell glasses. And this is going to be in the intro of our curriculum. So what we call the cell glasses is a pair of glass that you put on your eyes and you see situation through cell skills. So this is a teacher uh, tool. This is something you can use when you see some kind of behavior or a situation and you go, ah, I'm going to put my cell glasses on. What's going on? I think that kid needs help with self-management and regulation. So CELL is a framework, but it can help you also understanding situation. Actually, CELL is many things. It's a framework, we build programs, we write curriculums, but the CELL glasses are quite particular to Tara and I. We realize that by using this, you can understand situations super quick and you're quite efficient. You're not there to maybe fix it, but at least you understand. Okay, we have a problem with relationship skills. What are we gonna do? So it helps you understand. And it's not just for an individual. Last year we had terrible trouble in our grade five class. It was horrible. The girls were fighting all the time. And so we had a big meeting with the teachers and what should we do? And then I said, okay, put your glasses on everyone. And we're like putting our glasses, like, what's going on? My goodness, they can't regulate. <gasps> Self-awareness. Oh. And, you know, because we're quick, again, as teachers thinking, it's done, you know, they should be over this. They're grown up. They're not babies anymore. It's not done. It's not over. It will stop when they're 24. So <laughs> now that you know, you have to keep an eye. So then we realized that in grade five, the teachers have not been very good with practicing these, you know, energy shifting exercise or self-awareness and, and self-management, they, they had completely let go of that. And we had to bring all of these back in January. And we had to work harder because the kids had forgotten also about it. So in January, we just started again and things started improving quite quickly. But they had to maintain the practice all the way up to the end of year. And you know what happened this year? Grade six teacher come and see me in December. Oh, it's not going well in grade six. And I'm like, <laughs> well, put your cell glasses on. Oh, self-awareness management. Well, we knew, you know. You, you know, you, you had to start right from the beginning of year. Oh, yeah, we didn't do it. Okay, so then they started in January again. I know with this group, it's a, it's a trouble and they will have to practice. These kids, have, they're struggling in this area, so we have to do it every year. You know, now that you know it's, it's fun, we don't waste too much time. So the cell glasses are really important. And then you can look at situation, then you can flip them and look at your situation to evaluate your own skills and see where you may face challenges. Is it regulation, awareness? You're in a class, you're teaching, you just lose it one day. Thing is, happens to all of us. I remember I had a wonderful time one year in my grade two. Oh, I got so angry. It took me everything to just regulate. Almost losing control of the class is not a fun feeling 
for those of you who teach, you must have known that at least once or, or twice. So uh, I realized that if I couldn't regulate myself fast enough, well, of course, then the rest of the class was going to get dysregulated. So I turned the glasses on to me first, really quick, <sighs> managed to regulate and bring the situation around with a bit of humor at the end. But uh, so, so the cell glasses are really super important for you. So we're going to work with that too uh, during the week. So any questions on the presentation? Yes. I'm going to go really close, but make sure I hear. Yes. If is there's a distinct what? Any distinct special classification? Actually, like whatever information there is in the classes, there is a distinction. Yes, it is. How how do you come up with a reason that it should be separated? Oh, how do we come up with a reason it should be separated? Uh, because Cassell had done it without really knowing. I'll show you. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go fast. So this is a Cassell framework, and they had already done something because they put in orange was about the person, and this is the social area, and then responsible decision making. So they had done it already, but it's just like when I look at it like this, I had to memorize and it was long and it was I was teaching like other teachers and nobody was remembering and it's too much and then when we just click going well this one talks about me this is you and this is us huh that made it easy and it turns out that Cassell is thinking about reconfigurating it in three kinds of domains or three areas this is what I just heard from them so that's why but I do you find it easier to remember Oh, there you go. <laughs> you just said that uh, they are also trying to classify it yes. into three. Yes, uh, I, you, I spoke to you, someone. Do you intuitively think those three areas would be very much like you, me, and us? Well, yes. Well, that, that's what is implied. I mean, the, we, we love the, the cell framework. We, we just love it. I mean, we love the cell components, and I think we just pushed it to make more sense. And, and they're there. I don't know what it's going to look like, but when I, told, I spoke to someone who works, uh, she's on the board for Cassell. She's a, a researcher, and she says, oh, we're getting there. We're, we're going to put three something. And she didn't tell me what it was, and I'm like, well, we're using, I'll show you ours again. So, yeah. So, in here, this, um, you, tomorrow when you get the document, you'll see this is the practical framework, the theoretical. Theory behind this is, theoretical is that this is healthy relationship in the middle. So healthy relationship holds the three domains. Healthy relationship to the self, others, and community. How do I practice healthy relationship? Well, it's with feelings and needs, with an emotional literacy. This is how we practice the three domains. It's always reinvested there. And the impact, or the, what we see happening when we have this kind of model, is more engaged citizenship compassion and healthy relationship, okay? And <clears throat> when we work with schools, we always tell the school, we, we don't like to come and, oops, sorry, we don't like to come and say, change everything you're doing, use our curriculum. We, we, we look at what the school is doing because already in your school, you are doing social emotional learning. It's just that you don't know it. So you need to shine a light on it and see where you're doing it and then maybe enhance it in some areas, then you decide which one. I bet you it's you know, probably in the me domain that there is less done. Already things are done in the you and the us. And for each domain, you need to find a practice. How are you going to practice this or formalize a practice? So schools decide 
which practice is best for them. In the school where I am, the me domain is what we're going to do tomorrow. Emotion thermometer, emotional literacy with feelings and needs, and then energy shifting exercise. Oh, and just for fun, in Ladakh, when we worked with, uh, there was a geshe in Ladakh, for him this was Lojong. This was the area where, you know, you would do the mind training. In the U domain, what we do is we, we focus a lot on conflict resolution, so we have a system of disappointment notes, Sorry. disappointment notes, and gratitude notes. So we both celebrate and talk about things that don't go well. And then when things are well, well, then we celebrate it. So this is here. <clears throat> Sorry, it's very pale, you can't see. And in the us domain, we do a lot of circle discussion. You know, and we develop critical thinking. And we have one week a year where we have a whole school activity called Kindness Week. So this is my school's model. But it doesn't mean it's the best model for your school. Yes, for the social emotional learning bit, but then for your practices and what you want to put there, uh, then this is up to the school. But we find that this is the best way to do this. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. So it's more for an academic. Uh, it's more from an academic uh, point of view. Yes. Less from a practice point of view. I'm very happy that we're just looking at things that could be put into practice. Uh, I, I just want to know. Uh, you said that oh. these. I think it is. I'm just holding it awkwardly. Or something. Uh, yeah, oh, you know, you can speak closer. <laughs> You just said that you work with children and with teachers. So this kind of an exercise, when it is meant for, especially children at a very early age, when they're even in pre-primary. Oh, uh, if, if yeah. we can do this for pre-primary? Yes. Yes. And, and when they are into just the early primary years. Yes. You said, you already quoted a research saying that that seems to be the most beneficial outcome at eighth standard. So when you trace eight standard outcomes, you find it goes back to... Grade three social grade three. skills. Yes. Crazy. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which means if you could do it at pre-primary levels, uh, we, do, you, well, do you have that data? Or? Yes. Okay, Just so this is delicate because um, three, in, in where I am, we, we start, we have kids three and four-year-old in formal school. Okay, so three and four-year-old kids. Okay, three and four-year-old children um, they're still very young, but we can do basic emotional literacy, emotion recognition. What is important is it's not to force them into anything. So there's always an ethical element when we talk about developing. We'll talk about this tomorrow because I, you can never force emotions on people. But you have to offer a space where they can arise. And as an adult, you can facilitate, but we're not there to force. The best way to teach cell to small children is by being a model yourself. So the adults around these small kids are the key. So it's not so much about teaching them anything. It's I'm a caring individual. I'm going to demonstrate a warm, compassionate relationship. Children are going to feel safe. And this is the best social emotional learning you can give them. After that, there's a few things you can do. Like, well, we, we yes, yes. Uh, I, you know, I, I have a huge book. I call it the Cell Bible. It's got all the research. So they do talk about small children and the impact. And yes, there's a benefit, but we fully rely on the adult's connection and human skills. So, of course, if you're warm, caring, and the most important is making the child feel safe, then you will have positive benefits. So the adult is really the strongest model. And also this has an impact later on in life. So this age is actually quite critical, but it's the least research right now. And, and there's a lot that needs to be done. And it also goes into the theory of attachment. And yeah. yeah. But if you're interested, I can give you the name of the article. 
Yeah, I, I will. I will uh, find it for you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So we've been sitting for a long time. We're gonna go and play a silly game. So for this, you're gonna need one um, pen and this sheet of paper. There, I give this one to you. <laughs> okay, so this is called, uh, what did I call it? I called it, find someone in the room who, so I want you to take the sheet and we, we can go and play outside or here or outside outdoors, what do you prefer? Outdoors in the garden, yeah? Okay, so we're gonna go in the garden and I want you to find someone that fits this description. Have you ever been to Delhi? Yeah. So I would just take, oh yes, okay, She's, and then I go see someone else. Do you like to be quiet? No, okay, so, I, so you have to fill this sheet, okay? Ready? So let's, go, let's all go outside. Oh, I don't have one for me. Okay, before, before we go outside, actually, I'm going to give you this. This is your homework for tonight. It's not big, big homework. You need to read this. So this is from uh, Dan Goldman's re most recent book about His Holiness's work on education. Yes, it's called a force for good. Do you want me to re-explain the game or it's okay? Yes, one more time. So I have a mission. I have to tick all the squares on my paper by finding a person that matches this description. So I'm going to say, have you ever been to Delhi? Yes, so I got someone who's been to Delhi. Um, can you sing the opera? No, okay. Um, I have to find someone, if I can, who sings the opera. I don't know if there's someone. No, it might be, maybe someone sings the opera. <laughs> so maybe we'll find someone, maybe not. So try to tick as many boxes as you can. That means you have to ask people questions. You're, you're like a detective, okay? So let's go outside. <laughs> 